Hello everyone, welcome to lecture number 8, the first lecture where we'll, we will really begin programming. And without any further ado, let's jump into it. Let's just go ahead and get to the top right and new project. Alright, and once we're here, I'm going to go ahead and name it Motion Demo because... I'll actually show you. So right here, there's nine categories, right? And so we're going to do motion in this category. We're going to do looks and sound in the next lecture. So this is kind of go together. We're going to do controls, operators, and conditions. And you'll see what conditions are. It has to do with events mostly. And the lecture after that. Lastly, we'll do sensing and variables. And we'll actually we'll do something with my blocks, which is basically calling custom classes, as you'll see. Don't get overwhelmed by that terminology as it'll make sense. And by the end of section two, which is this section, you'll have mastered all of these blocks, concepts, and uh, what all basically what all of these do. And I say mastered, but you're going to need to practice some and still put in some initiative and put in some effort in order to really get these down. But if you pay attention, you should be just fine. And again, we'll go over several example projects to reinforce all of the concepts presented throughout this section because there's three sections after this, section three, four, and five, where we will work on very exciting programming projects. And so let's learn how these motion blocks work. Now the blocks are color coded, okay? So they're color coded by category. So the motion blocks are blue, uh, you know, this dark blue, okay? So what can I do with these motion blocks? Well, I can actually uh, do things while related to motion. So what do I mean by this? I can I can move 10 steps in the direction I'm facing. But what does steps mean? And what is this number? What's the significance of this number 10? In fact, how does this even work? And what am I moving? And what, you know, there's a lot of questions. So, so let me start from the the very bottom and just work our way up. So we have this sprite selected. We already talked about sprites and stages and backdrops and costumes. We have this sprite selected. Now the sprite has two costumes, but we're, you know, actually I'll name it cat. So you probably won't find yourself using the move function too much, but what the, and keep in mind this right here, this block is a function. So what we're doing is we're moving 10 steps. Really what this means is moving 10 pixels. Steps just means pixels. So we're moving 10 pixels. Let's say I want to move 50 pixels, we can move 50 pixels. So we remember over here, one number equals one pixel. So if we're x50, it would be 50 pixels to the right. If we're x negative 50, it would be 50 pixels to the left and so on. Now, here's the thing. Our cat will only move, or any sprite will only move in the direction it's facing, which happens to be 90 degrees. So if we wanted to move 50 pixels in this direction, we would go ahead and execute this function like so. And now we're at x50, y0 as predicted. I can even move them back to where we started by moving minus 50 steps. And really you're reading this as move minus 50 pixels, which is just 50 pixels to the left. Now let's go ahead and run this and boom. We're all good to go. So let's uh, let's implement something. Let's actually drag and drop some functions together to create our first script. That was our first function. You're already programming, which is really cool. So now there's two turn of functions. And notice how there's kind of spacers between each of these kind of categories where they, well, I guess really subcategories where they kind of group related blocks together within a bigger category. So you have motion, but then these are all kind of grouped together. But here's our turn functions. There's two. Now one is clockwise and one is counterclockwise. Let me explain clockwise and counterclockwise for those of you that don't know. So clockwise is going in the direction that a clock turns. So it is going to the right and it is always going to the right. And the counterclockwise is against the direction a clock turns. So it is always going to the left always going to the left. Now, that is once you're, yeah, there's there's another way to explain it, but if you actually watch a clock, an analog clock, and this is probably the best way to practice if you still don't fully understand it, which is totally fine, watch the way that the 
all the hands on the clock move. Uh, particularly the seconds hand, if, if the clock has one. It moves clockwise. Now the direction against that is counterclockwise, and these arrows actually represent that as well. Now the the parameter here, which is what we would call this number between, by the way, so there's a parameter of 10 here, there's a parameter of 15 here, there's also a parameter of 15 here. The parameter has to do with the value that you're passing to the function. That is very important if you're taking notes, write that down because you're going to need to know that in any computer program you're dealing with. Parameters are the value you're passing to the function. Okay, so let's say I want to turn 30 degrees clockwise. I'll pass a parameter of 30 to the turn clockwise function. And now, well, I accidentally clicked it twice. Uh, see how I'm at 150 right now? If I do it again, now I'm at 180. If I go 15 degrees, a parameter of 15, I'm passing that to my clockwise function. If I turn 15 degrees counterclockwise, it'll start subtracting this by 15, and thus moving me 15 degrees counterclockwise. I'll go back to 90, which is where we were initially. Okay, let's combine these functions, as I said, to make a script. Let's go ahead and turn 15 degrees right after moving 10 steps, just like this. Now, if we keep doing this, we'll turn in a circle because whenever we move 10 steps, which is the direction we're facing, then we change the direction we're facing by the same amount each time, we eventually end up in a circle. And as you can see, we're back at x0 and y0, thus completing the circle. Let's take a look at some of these other functions. Here's go to, I'll actually put these away just to make it cleaner for you guys. Go to random position is exactly what it says. It goes to a random position on the screen. Now it can go a little off the screen, but the center of the sprite cannot go off the screen. As you can see, occasionally part of the cat will go off the screen, but as long as the center of the sprite is on screen, it will still count. So basically, as long as some of it's visible, in this case, it's a random position, so it's just going to keep going to a random position whenever I execute this function. But I'll manually put the cat back to x0, y0. And what if there was a quicker automatic way to do this? Well, then this function's for you. The one that goes to, and you're going to find yourself using this a lot. Now, this function has two parameters. It's the first function we've seen with two parameters. And by the way, what we'd call this function is a drop down parameter. So we can also go to mouse pointer. It's a little bit hard to demonstrate because we don't have something that's repeating this function over and over, so we can't really follow the mouse pointer, but whenever we click it'll work, so it's going to go as close as it can to our mouse every time we run this function, and that's just a cool thing, so I'm going to put us back at x0, y0. So that's called a drop-down parameter, but this is the first double parameter function we've seen, which means there's two parameters or two values to pass to the function. So we can have this go to x0, y0. So if I move them over here, notice how he's at x negative 219, y 144, we can move them back to the center of the screen or origin, x0, y0, by clicking this. And send it anywhere we want, let's say x negative 50, y 30, which is to the left and up. Let's run the function, boom, to the left and up. And let's move them back to the center, just like that, pass our parameters to the function correctly. We want a x0 and a y0, I'll run that, and boom, we're back at the center. Now, there's also something called a glide, and there's actually two glide functions. One has a drop-down parameter, and one has a double parameter. Again, we can go to a random position, or the mouse pointer, but instead of going to it, and the difference between go and glide is that go is kind of an instant teleportation, and glide is, well, a glide. So, we can glide whatever, and this is a uh, manual parameter here, so one that we have to decide, we'll just do one seconds for now. It'll travel one second, it'll travel for one second to a random position on the screen. Just like that. Notice how the speed changes each time because it'll balance it to make it one second. So every time I do this, it takes exactly one second to go to a random position, but depending on how far away it is, that'll determine the speed of the glide. You can also do the same thing for the mouse pointer. Again, it'll go as close as it can to the mouse pointer, and in this case, it's off screen. So that's why it's not actually going outside of this 
place here, this screen here, and going all the way into the editor. It's not going to do that. It's just going to go as close as it can if my mouse pointer is outside. So now we can actually, this triple parameter function where we can glide for however many seconds to a specific point. So let's say we want to glide to x50, y negative 60, which is to the right and down in quadrant four, if you guys remember quadrants, just like that. So no matter where I put them, I'll always glide for one second to that specific spot. But if I want to make them glide really slow, I can go glide five seconds, therefore going five times as slow because it'll take them five seconds to reach that position, just like so, and it'll take five seconds. What if I wanted to glide really fast? Well, let's demonstrate with this drop down again. Of course, it'll work with this as well. We can go 0.1 seconds, 100 milliseconds, or a tenth of a second would be another way to put that. Usually in programming, by the way, we use milliseconds instead of seconds. So this would be 100 milliseconds. This would be 5,000 milliseconds. Basically, just multiply the seconds by 1,000. And to get seconds from milliseconds, just divide the milliseconds by 1,000. So that's how you would convert. Now we can use this to almost teleport, but there's still a little bit of a glide there. It takes a tenth of a second, or again, 100 milliseconds, to teleport using, or to glide, I guess, to using this function. So let's just glide for half a second back to the center of the screen, and we'll move on. Really fun thing to practice with, actually. You're gonna wanna make sure you know these four. These four are really important. Now let's go with direction and point. So these two functions are very closely related. Here is just the same thing as this. So this is the same thing as this. And in fact, we even have this same handy circle. So if I want to go and point in direction 180, I can point in direction 180 by running this function or whatever other direction I choose. And I'll just go back to 90. Of course, I don't have to drag the circle. I can also manually input a number just like so. And like so. Let's talk about point towards for a second. Point towards is a drop down parameter function with only one possible parameter, which happens to be the mouse pointer. Now, of course, if you have other sprites, there will be more options here. So you could point towards bat or point towards sprite number two or whatever you're doing. So uh, let's just point towards the mouse pointer. Again, off the screen, they'll still point towards as much as it can. Let's just reset our direction to 90. All right, so these four are very important and very closely related, and you're going to be using these a ton. So there's change X and change Y. There's set X and set Y. Let's go over the change ones first. What change does is it changes the X value by the specified parameter, and what change Y does is it, is it changes the Y value by the specified parameter. Let's say I want to move 10 pixels up. I can go change Y by 10. Let's say I want to move 10 pixels to the right. I can change X by 10. Of course, I can go back. If I want to go 10 pixels to the left, negative 10. If I want to go 10 pixels down, negative 10, or whatever other number I want, just like so. Set X and set Y is the essentially the same thing, except for it sets it to that pal uh, to that parameter as a default. So basically, if we want to set our X value to negative 50. Instead of moving, uh, let's say I'm all the way over here. Instead of moving however many, however much the distance between 83 and negative 50 is, we can just immediately set our x to negative 50. Instead of moving down, like changing y by negative 123, I apologize. No matter where we are, we can, no matter where we are on our vertical axis, we can set our y to zero without changing a specific amount. Set our x to zero. And boom, we're back at the center of the screen. And you'll see more uh, how this is more useful as we continue to use it in the future. Now, if on edge bounce is interesting, what this does is if part of the sprite is off screen, it'll bounce. Just like that. And of course, it can actually rotate a little bit automatically, which is why I'm not a huge fan of this feature. But it's still a cool thing to do. Just like that. And it might not always be perfect either. So it might be a few pixels are still off screen, but it still makes a drastic difference. Lastly, we have set rotation style. 
if you remember what these three buttons here did, it's the exact same thing. All the round is the default and the one I recommend using most of the time. Left, right means there's only two positions. Actually, let's set the rotation style to that. So that's what left, right does. I'll set it back to 90. And again, don't rotate, it's just a temporary lock. So if I change the direction, it won't take into a, f or actually let me, I apologize. I never actually set it. Okay, let's activate this. Now if I change the direction, it won't do anything until I unlock it by going back to all around or left, right. Let's set it, and boom. And so it does again, I primarily use all around. And you probably won't find yourself using this set rotation style too much, but it's very good to know what it does, of course. And we talked about functions, but there's also values. So what are these values? There's three values for the motion category. So this is X position, this is Y position, and this is direction. So the X position of, of our cat sprite is negative 60 at the moment, and our Y position is 13 at the moment. Our direction is 90. Now we can actually check these boxes here to show these values on screen. We can also double click these to get a different view of the value. So if we don't want it to show cat or the name of the sprite and then whatever the value name is, we can just go ahead and do that. But usually I almost never use these boxes and I usually keep them hidden. So let's demonstrate this. Since my direction is 90, if I want to move 90 steps, I could just plug in direction for move steps, and there's better ways to do this, but just, this is just an example. This should put me at about x30, because it moves me 90 pixels, as that's what the value of my direction is. And then it passes the direction value as a parameter to my move steps function, and we'll have a lot more practice with this type of thing in the near future. So this is it for the motions category now that you're a pro. Uh, well, it's always good to practice and do some more outside of the lecture because there's always going to be things that don't make sense right away. You can also use a scratch wiki or other resources. Again, there will be a quick quiz after this lecture as always to make sure you know some of the basics or just some random trivia. And we'll get into looks and sound in the next lecture, which will be really cool. And we'll start uh, putting some puzzle pieces together. And I look forward to exploring looks and sound with you guys in the next lecture, which will be lecture number nine.